I'm Aaron Fawn. And I'm on a trip for life. Cosmos is full beyond measure. Elegant truths of exquisite interrelationships of the awesome machinery of nature. I believe our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos in which we float like a boat of dust. As you might know, I've been calling the lovely city of Ann Arbor, Michigan my home for the past year. Given my interests, it's no surprise that I have gravitated towards the growers and local boards that are working to make Washtenaw County green and sustainable. One project that has had a great impact upon the community is the Selma Cafe, which works with local, small farmers to help them network and distribute their goods to the towns and cities around this area of Michigan, primarily through a weekly breakfast that helps showcase our local food including food from some people you're probably familiar with if you've been watching The Trip for Life, such as delicious milk and butter from the Calder Dairy. But Jeff McCabe and Lisa Godley, the brains behind the project, are taking their work a step further, by getting the community together to fund and build hoop houses for local farmers so that they can continue to provide fresh produce through the winter. Having participated in this movement for a few months, I felt privileged to join Jeff and Lisa after a delicious local breakfast to talk about their projects and what impact they hope to make upon our community and our agriculture. Thank you very much for joining me on The Trip for Life. I'm uh, uh, happy to uh, have you two with me today. You two have been involved in a, a very interesting uh, local war movement here in Ann Arbor. Uh, would you like to d describe uh, what you've been doing with Selma Cafe and what you hope to accomplish with it? Sure. Uh, our organization is called Selma Cafe, and that is a name that other things are umbrellaed under, but Selma Cafe originally started as a weekly breakfast salon where we offered uh, breakfast in our house every Friday morning, and every week we have a different guest chef come in and offer breakfast specials using ingredients that are sourced locally and seasonally, and people come in and um, offer, they, they give a suggested donation and um, the money that comes in first goes to purchase all the ingredients for the breakfast so that we're supporting the local food com uh, economy by um, sourcing from farmers and farmers markets and uh, small businesses where the money's staying in the community. And the rest of the money goes out to microloans for farmers so that they can purchase hoop house kits and our volunteers help erect those kits on the farmer's land and we do it in a one day hoop building, um, similar to an Amish barn raising, and um, so those two things are pretty closely linked these days. We've been doing Selma Cafe, the breakfast salon, for uh, over two years, um, every Friday, uh, and um, the specials, the food that's served, uh, is determined primarily by what we can source at any given time. So I've noticed that you have a very close partnership with local farmers. Indeed, a lot of them come in here to eat breakfast with you guys. Mm. Um, what have you found most rewarding about this relationship that you've built with these local farmers? Well, I think we can both speak to that and we may speak differently. I, I think for me, um, whatever, however we're building the local food economy, the, the fact that we're supporting small farmers, which they're struggling these days, um, that we're keeping, we're keeping money in the community. All those things are really important. We're making good food, we're serving it to the community. I think all that's really important. For me, there's another level though of bringing community together. I think people are really hungry, not just for good food, but for affiliation and connection with each other. Not just through virtual communication like emails and texts and phone, but in person, working together in the kitchen making food, working together serving food, cleaning up, and then at the hoop house builds. So I think it's really, really important that we focus a lot of energy and attention on local for farms and farmers to support that, to increase that, so that we really have control over our food supply, so we're not just getting food from corporate, um, from corporate operations, but from farmers that we know and care about and have an investment in, and we want to encourage others to do that as well. Having attended a few of these breakfasts, I can certainly say that the conversations and the uh, community that develops here is, is really great. So you've accomplished something great with that. I have to applaud you for it. Uh, you mentioned a uh, hoop house project that you've been involved in. Uh, what has inspired you to, uh, to to help farmers to raise hoop houses? What's so great about hoop houses that they're worth mm -hmm. investing your time in? I guess what I would first do is just go back to, to um, the 10% Washington campaign and the idea of what we are trying to build here. Um, People spend a lot of 
their income on food. And people tend to spend around $3,000 a person per year on food. And in our county alone, that adds up to a billion dollar food system. And almost all that food comes from somewhere else. Um, even the food that, that, that comes through the farmer's market, I think a lot of people just think of that as something that's almost uh, a tourist uh, opportunity in the middle of summer to do this quaint little thing of going and buying a little food. And they don't really get into the habit of buying food year round. So uh, besides just the volume of food that can happen when we start winter production, there's really just shifting people's perceptions of what, what the local food economy can be. And I think that's going to be one of the most important things we see as we build a four season food system. So hoop houses uh, are a key ingredient in that. They allow the farmer to um, plant uh, on such a schedule that they can harvest something every day of the year. And then through that we're seeing both uh, CSA uh, programs, that Community Support Agriculture program, move from just an 18-week distribution in the middle of summer to something that uh, can go 50, 52 weeks a year, and also the ability to feed uh, people through other uh, means, through, through institutions, through schools, where they, they have a year that goes almost the opposite of what the uh, summer production would be. There's also this idea, too, of reducing our carbon footprint. A lot of people <clears throat> don't like the idea of buying salad greens from California or even farther away during the winter, um, not just because we don't necessarily know the growing practices. You know, growing, getting food from huge farms where the, the practices aren't safe, people get sick, um, and that it's coming from so far away that with this ability to harvest food year-round in our area, Suddenly, there's more money staying in our community, but it's safer and it's growing our food shed. So if we, <clears throat> if we just supported summer production, I think what we'd see is even more price competition in the middle of summer and just more people showing up with tomatoes in October at the farmer's market, which is really not what we need. We don't need to be increasing production without scaling up the demand side of the equation. And so uh, four season production is really expanding into a place where there's lots of uh, demand already. And like I say, if we, if we can really have people think about this being available to them year round, they can start to think about building that into their habits. And uh, finance, I guess, being the other piece, that no matter how much we want to see this happen, there isn't a lot of finance and, and no business sector has ever really emerged without a finance uh, mechanism to help people invest in the production to, to make this happen. So that's where um, loans for hoop houses specifically was our primary target for helping this food system grow. So you raised several interesting points. But let's uh, talk first about uh, why you have chosen to go with sort of an Amish model of uh, raising these hoop houses. Why do you rely upon volunteers rather than hiring uh, crews? Well, I mean, I think both for Selma and yeah. for the builds, uh, we, they, they're both really models of something that could happen in any kind of viable, perpetual model. You know, uh, Selma Cafe could become a permanent restaurant someplace that hires people. Right now, the, the volunteers are the catalyst. They're the thing that makes it net about 66% of the money. Mm -hmm. We spend about a third of it on the food, and because of the volunteer nature, it can have a great impact. Same thing with the hoop houses. We hope to eventually have professional crews that go around and put these up. But what can make that happen, what can make it happen now, what can make it viable and less expensive for those farmers to start with, as we're trying to prove this model, is volunteers that are just dying to come out and help. We've so, asked them, we, you know, we've been at the middle of a hoop field and say to people, what brought you here today? And they say, we want to work. We want to physically have our hands in the dirt. We want to do something that has a measurable difference and a positive change for our community. You organize it, we will show up and work. And again, it's this idea of building the local economy, creating food, and also bringing people together to work together, not in virtual reality, but in real time, solving problems, physically working. Yeah. People and want that. It's important to note just the scale that this really has built to. We have uh, 540 some people who are signed up volunteers to work on Selma Cafe projects in general. We had about 300 people participate in this uh, hoop house building blitz that we just had in June and July. That to, by, by putting in multiple days as well uh, contributed over 500 volunteer days 
to make this happen. So it's a lot of people who are very engaged and want to see, um, want to, to invest their time and spend their time uh, doing something that has a measurable difference. This idea of doing them in one day, it's a really great model because you gather people together, you start in the morning, we feed them really well, <clears throat> and by the end of the day it's done and we have a big party and it's a celebration. And it seems like, I mean, that, that what we call the Amish barn raising model works really well for people and it's been working It's not for just us. an Amish no, practice, I'm not sure why. Because I think that's when we talk about it that way, that's usually people know exactly yeah, what Yeah, maybe the Amish about. or the, 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 the farm, farmers sure. that have carried this into sure. our, our yeah. current uh, uh, time frame, yeah. uh, like they have many practices that have disappeared. Sure. Uh, barn raisings uh, among almost any farm community yes. was a key way that the community could come together and do something that the farmer could never really pull off on their own. And whether that all was just this very casual way that it all came around in some way, that everybody showed up for, for the people that needed it when they needed it, it wasn't the only thing no. that gets done that way to put bringing up a barn. Hay, and, exactly. and straw. Yeah. And, and it's also much more, I mean, when I think about those sorts of barn raisings, the, the delineation of work was very clear. The women brought the food and the men did the work. And, and our model is very different from that. It's extremely inclusive. and. Whoever wants to make food makes food, and we have everyone from small kids who are well supervised on site to, you know, older grandparents working. It's a big range of people from a variety of backgrounds, um, and they're all coming together because they have this interest in sustainable uh, local food and building community around it. And not only are we building hoop houses, then when we when we do these days, we have very uh, big ideas for, for what can happen. It's going to take a lot of people doing a lot of work and it can't even all organize under just this one umbrella. It needs to uh, really uh, be spread out through the community. So what we're building besides hoop houses, we're building capacity. All these people are learning, they can put their own twist on it, go out and organize however they want and continue this work. I understand that you've actually developed your own hoop house kit to help deal with some of the technical challenges of raising a hoop house in a single day. Would you mind talking a little bit about what inspired that and how you're pulling that off? Well, I uh, have been putting up various kits from various manufacturers and what I've noticed is that most of those are nursery industry companies that happen to have a product that can be used for this diversified vegetable production. And it's uh, not ideal, and I don't even think our first prototypes really solve all the problems. But no one seems to have really put attention to the specifics of growing food in the ground. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're looking at ways that um, the features that are needed by these farmers, what they're expressing they need, can be uh, accomplished in the most economical way. So uh, putting up uh, woven uh, poly end walls is a, with, with zippers in them for large doors and storm screen doors is a way to accomplish all the uh, enclosure and access needs in a very economical way. And making the kits um, pre-drilled, the sort of a rector set idea makes it easy for uh, people without uh, a lot of tools and a lot of skills to put them together. So we're, we're looking at those uh, metrics and trying to solve that as much as we can. And finally, a lot of people have uh, criticized the local war movement as being sort of this hobbyist thing, that it can't really build a model for a better and more sustainable agricultural future because it just won't scale up. Um, there is a lot of controversy in this regard, and I personally believe that there is a great deal of uh, potential for this to be a, a, a viable model for the future. But how do you envision uh, agriculture in the United States evolving over time in a uh, uh, response to these pressures that they're on, it's under currently. Well, the first thing I would say to address that is, what's the alternative? I mean, if if you don't have something to say that's uh, a model that that is uh, somehow better than what is being ramped up or what was existing, um, if you want to just uh, poo-poo this because that's fun and hip to do, and leave us with this chemical agriculture system. Uh, consolidated agriculture system that is obviously uh, not sustainable, uh, that's, that's uh, not doing much to solve this problem. I think that um, what's going to happen is it might start out like a lot of things do as seeming elitist, expensive, etc. 
And it's going to take time for different people to really bring the kind of innovations and whatnot to make it more accessible. Uh, the main thing is that it provides a lot of jobs to the community and it cre creates uh, money in the community that stays in the community. And that uh, really, uh, you can't go wrong with that at any scale. And more than really looking forward to something, you know, can we get to 100%? That's not the way I think about it. It's the next logical step because there's so many different variables that we won't even know are going to happen years from now. Uh, let's look at the ones that make sense right now. You know, I, I don't feel like we have all the answers. We, we, don't, we don't know everything we're doing, but we're both really invested in trying to do something measurable. And there's a lot of people who volunteer for us who feel the same way. They don't know the long-term answers. They know what's happening now isn't working. And they know if they go out and build a hoop house in a day, they've changed something measurable. And we've built hoop houses in Ann Arbor, we've built hoop houses in urban Detroit where there really is no food, and now people can show up at these hoops and get real delicious produce that they couldn't get before. And I think, I think that's the way to go about it. We were working um, small time in the community, grassroots, building hoop by hoop by hoop and sending these ideas out. And I think we're claiming to know everything about it, but we know this part that we're doing and we know it's working and and to me that's about the most hopeful thing there is and I, I think other people feel like it's hopeful too and I think that's the key. If people feel hope and they feel like they're doing something that's measurably changing things for the better, then that's where the impetus comes for huge overall change. Yeah, there is a lot of potential for these symbolic gestures that can happen. At the same time, uh, I really look at the, the science and the economics of what's going on. And the way that that next logical step plugs in is through the very simple relocalization models like uh, uh, import substitution. And so if you've got a product that's being imported into your area and people are paying a certain price for it, and you can produce that product at the same price and give people that alternative, that's something that makes sense. It doesn't have to only be carried by the, the wishes of this community. It just happens on simple economics. And that's what happens with salad greens and hoop houses. They can be uh, produced here for the same price that people are paying for Earthbound Farm or these other things at Whole Foods and other distributors. And they can go right on the same shelf and compete dollar for dollar with those products. And that's why we're starting again with these hoop houses. This is something that is very viable in the market right now. It, I like it when we have these conversations together because Jeff has the, the economics and the numbers model. And my model is much more about, is this, is this connecting people? Is this giving people a sense that what they're doing has value? And that combination, that, that container for all those things, I think is a really powerful model. Make it work financially, um, build the financial and the economic community, and make sure that everyone feels inclusive and important and is happy with their day's work. And you know, so far we've been doing this for over two years. We've built close to two dozen hoops, if not a little more. And you know, it's it's still strong. It's going strong. And I think when you ask us long term, we want to keep doing it. Jeff and Lisa are excellent spokespeople for the whole concept of local food, and I look forward to our conversations over breakfast in the future. I actually participated heavily in the Hoop House Build Project, as you might have gathered from all the clips you've seen in this video. Building a responsive and ecologically conscious local food system is something that requires investment, if only with our sweat and time. But the potential return on this investment is truly worth it. Together, we can build a sustainable, flexible, and delicious source of food that enriches your neighbors rather than some global corporate empire. I wanted to leave off with a short music video of a very appropriate song, as performed by a local band, Hullabaloo, at the party we threw celebrating the success of the build. Thanks for watching and enjoy. So the next one is a, is a brand new song, and I like to think we kind of wrote it for all y'all. Uh, but I want to dedicate it to Jeff and Lisa and Tom and Trilby and all of the farmers and the volunteers and everyone who's come out for one of these builds. This was a really amazing thing you all did. Um, but this one's called America on Sunshine. It's brand new. We have not even recorded it yet. Sunshine. Sunshine. I'll be on 